With any dream, the wind won't always be at your back, the sun won't always be shining, and some rain is going to fall. American Family Insurance is like a good solid roof that you can trust to protect your biggest dreams. With plans that could save you up to 23% when you bundle your home and auto. Also, you can continue to dream fearlessly, no matter what comes your way. American Family Insurance. Get a quote or find an agent at AmFam.com. Visit AmFam.com to learn how discounts may apply to you. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, S.I. and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin. You are listening to Another Last Time by Dirty Honey there on Monco Radio, where music and minds meet. And this is Meet the Press Slam, right here on Monco Radio, where music and minds meet. I have a very special guest with me on Monco Radio, where music and minds meet. And on the Social Suplex Podcast Network, I have the king of banter himself from the Voices of Wrestling Podcast Network. He is Joe Lanza. How you doing, Joe? Man, I'm excited. I, I didn't realize I was on a, a heavy metal radio show. You're not going to ask me any questions about, like, Slayer or anything, right? Because I'm not going to be able to help you with that. No, no, no. I I am actually not going to ask you about anything doing with Slayer or anything. I'm going to ask you about your expertise, pro wrestling, because it is pro wrestling that we're talking about here on Monco Radio, where music and minds meet, and we're going to start off with WrestleMania. Uh, how, how do you feel this build of WrestleMania is going for this year? WrestleMania, the actual two-day WrestleMania event. Yes, and then we're by... going to go into the weekend, the indie events and stuff like that. So, Yeah, sure. So I think that you know, they made the decision months ago that they weren't going to ride the hot hand with Sami Zayn. And they had Roman beat Sami at the Elimination Chamber. And then it's full steam ahead with Roman and Cody. And I think that, that um, you know, we could debate that all day, whether right. that was the right call or whether they should have done – possibly Roman versus Sammy on one of the nights and Roman versus Cody on the second night. But that's not the direction they went, and it's probably wasted energy at this point to continue debating whether they should have stuck with the uh, Sami Zayn match. It's it's very obvious here that he's going to be in a tag bout with Kevin Owens against the Usos, and they stuck with their original plans. And, you know, there is something to be said for that in a company that has a bad reputation for constantly changing their plans – uh, that this year they stuck to their guns and and apparently stuck to the long term plan of Roman Reigns versus Cody and Sami Zayn being involved in a tag team program with the Usos. So you know there's two sides to that argument. There's the well, it's pro wrestling. Do you ride the hotter hand, or do you stick with your original plans and 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 let them play out? And I think what made that decision easier for them is Cody himself is pretty hot. Yeah, I don't know if he ever got as hot as Sami Zayn got. And I would argue that Sami Zayn has cooled off to some degree after losing to Roman Reigns. And, but, uh, but they had a nice fallback option with, with the Cody-Roman match. And I think that um, while some of the directions of that match haven't been uh, necessarily to my liking, I think there's been, you know, can we go more than 20 seconds without bringing up Dusty Rhodes? I mean, I, I think I could live without that aspect of the build. And I think they even sort of went in that direction over the last week or so with 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 Cody, you know, basically flat out saying, "I'm tired of talking about Dusty Rhodes." But uh, but other than that, I think that the uh, performances of both Cody and Roman Reigns on the microphone have been very strong. And um, you know, the television ratings, uh, you know, they're still good. Uh, you could argue that they're still great, right. but they're not indicative of a red hot company going into the event. I'm not seeing massive week over week growth because people are super excited about this event or or about this match. Uh, In fact, there's been plenty of week over week uh, negative growth in some of the raw and SmackDown ratings leading up to the event. Again, the the show, the the ratings are still doing very well. Uh, I'm not suggesting that these builds are bombing. I'm not suggesting that the event won't be a success, but, uh, I'm not sure that the television ratings are an indicator of this alleged red hot company that we've been told about. I think that they've cooled off to some degree and that may be because they pumped the brakes on Sami Zayn and, and people just aren't quite as excited about Roman versus Cody as they are versus Roman versus Sami. 
which would make a lot of sense since Roman versus Sammy was built over a number of months and Roman Cody really has only become a thing since the Royal Rumble. Right. And I, I sort of felt like going with the hot hand and Sammy would have been the right decision in most years, given that, you know, they get, they, they have gone with the hotter hand most of the time. But you have the hot hand in Cody as well. You have a good soup, good solution in Cody Rhodes, who is a who is an international superstar in his own right. There, but I'm not feeling this card as a whole in terms of builds, in terms of reputation. The Charlotte Flair Ray Ripley stuff is not compelling to me. The only stuff that's very compelling is the stuff with the bloodline and the Usos. The Usos and Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens, which everyone's going to argue whether that's your main event night one and not Charlotte versus Rhea, but at the end of the day, wrestling politics is wrestling politics. Well, I told people right after Elimination Chamber on my outlet, the Voice of the Wrestling Flagship Podcast, which you can listen to every Friday on your favorite podcatcher or listen to live every Thursday night, behind our paywall at patreon.com slash uh, voice of wrestling that once Sami Zayn lost at the elimination chamber, and it was obvious that he was no longer going to be in a singles match with Roman Reigns at WrestleMania, that he was going to be in the tag team match. And it was destined to be on the undercard of one of these two shows. And that Sami Zayn was not going to be in a main event. That was obvious. Uh, They went with Charlotte Flair versus Rhea Ripley, a match with uh, very little build. A match with uh, in a company and for a fan base that just obsesses over build and storyline, storyline, storyline. Right. Give us a story. You know th- this match. Y- you cannot argue that it's worthy of a main event slot from that standpoint. It just isn't. I think what we have here is w- WWE to such a size that um, it, they, they almost feel obligated to make sure that one of the two nights is headlined by a women's match, and that's what they're doing here. And they've chosen their best option. They've, they've chosen what they feel is their best option. They feel Charlotte Flair and Rhea Ripley is a bigger match than Bianca Belair Asuka. And that's really what it comes down to. I think people have to stop. Uh, it doesn't do you any good to compare Charlotte Flair, Rhea Ripley to the Usos versus Sami Zayn and Kevin Owens because that's not the way the company is assessing this. They're giving one main event to a women's match. So you have to weigh it against Bianca Belair Asuka. Uh and if that's the case, honestly, to me, that's a toss-up anyway because I don't think either one of those matches are particularly compelling or well-built or hot. So at, at that point, what does it really matter? Right. So if we're playing under WWE's rules and we're going to have a women's match in the main event slot, I don't know. You know, The criticism should be why haven't they built one of these matches well enough to make it feel like a WrestleMania main event? To me, that's where the criticism should lie because neither one of them do. I agree. There and this WrestleMania weekend is not looking all too appealing in terms of wrestling standards. And this used to be the peak of the wrestling year in terms of everyone's going to be showcased, every company is coming down here, and that's just not the case anymore. You have GCW puts on a bunch of shows, you have Impact putting on a show, and then RA Supercard of Honor. And it's not what it used to be. Uh, it, it, listen, this is the weakest. And listen, no disrespect to the talent that's there. Okay. But this is without question the weakest lineup of talent at a WrestleMania weekend that I've seen maybe in a decade. It's, it's you know, the days of the loaded WrestleMania weekends with the loaded shows, with the greatest talent in the world, they're over. And, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that that we don't have time to get into. It's happened slowly over the course of a number of years, but it is what it is. And then when you look at the fact that um, Will Ospreay is injured and he's off a lot of the shows and he had a big match against Mike Bailey, that's not going to happen. When you look at the fact that Davey Richards is having some legal issues and has once again retired from wrestling and uh, is no longer welcomed on uh, you know on, on these on these shows, 
So you lose the Davey Richards, John Moxley match at Bloodsport. And now today with the breaking news that Josh Alexander has a serious injury and he's going to have to vacate the impact world title. And, you know, now Josh Alexander versus Kushida is not happening. Josh Alexander versus Michael Oku at the, at the Mark Hitchcock Memorial Super Show won't be happening. When you remove Will Ospreay, Davey Richards, and, 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 and Josh Alexander from a WrestleMania weekend that was already very light on talent, and now you've lost three of the best wrestlers uh, th- that were going to be participating in the weekend, it's just a dire situation. They're, they're, you know, we've, w- by losing those three guys, we've lost you know, uh, most of the, you know, a, a decent chunk of the most compelling matches overall on the weekend. But um, I do think there's still going to be some good stuff. I think the ROH Supercard of Honor, that card looks phenomenal. And I, I think that is the front runner, the easy front runner for uh, a show of the weekend, at least on paper. I look at the Mark Hitchcock Memorial Super Show. And, you know, even without, even with losing Will Ospreay, Davey Richards, and Josh Alexander, who had all been booked on that show, um, I'm not even sure they had a match set for Ospreay yet. But, uh, you know, Richards gets removed from his tag with Tom Lawler against Kenta and Brian Keith. They'll have to replace him there. Michael Oku is going to need a new opponent. But you still have some decent stuff on there. They're going to have a, 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 a Vikingo versus Taurus versus Commander three-way which is going to be absolutely bonkers. And we just found out last night that Vikingo is going to be facing Commander at the ROH, right. at the ROH Supercard of Honor show. And that, that has a chance to be the, the match of the weekend. So, you know, now Vikingo, after the great match against Kenny Omega on Dynamite, gets kind of thrown into the WrestleMania weekend spotlight as what I think the spotlight performer and the guy with the best chance to steal the weekend because he's in the kinds of matches that are going to allow him to do so. Uh, Negro Casas versus Ultimo Dragon looks like a, 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 a match that is unique and fun uh, for a variety of reasons, even if those two guys probably can't reach, you know, quote unquote, you know, five star standards at this point in their careers. I think that's a match people want to see. Uh, Shigehiro Iri versus Mike Bailey. So there's some uh, really good stuff on that Mark Hitchcock Memorial Super Show, which is, um, you know, obviously the old uh, used to be called the WrestleCon Super Show before Mark Hitchcock. Right. Uh, unfortunately passed away, um, you know, but, but that's always a solid show. The super card of honor show looks good. Uh, and other than that, you know, blood sport is always unique and a lot of fun, you know, but they're going to need a new main event, you know, with, 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 uh, with Moxley not having an opponent now. Um, and, you know, Kota Ibushi will be there working uh, for the first time in a long time on some of the game changer shows and on blood sport against Mike Bailey. So, you know, it's not completely barren, but I think by losing those three key top of the line workers on what was already kind of a thin weekend, you're looking at ROH Supercard of Honor, you're looking at the Mark Hitchcock Memorial Show, you're looking at Bloodsport, and outside of that, you know, there really isn't a ton there. I mean, maybe there's some people who are still into the Joey Janela Spring Breaks. I get it. It's probably going to sell a million tickets again. I'm sure it's sold out. That's not really my thing anymore, but to each his own. You want to throw that one in there? Go right ahead. And uh, But other than that, man, I don't know. This is one of the weakest looking – this is the weakest looking WrestleMania weekend lineup that I can recall. Yeah. Also on the Joey Janela Spring Break, it's Hio Del Vikingo versus Mike Bailey, which that, that sounds phenomenal. But- yeah, and this is what I'm saying. Vikingo is really poised. You know, every year at WrestleMania weekend – you know, when it winds down on Sunday and, and, it, and, and, and the calendar turns to Monday, we talk about who was the MVP of the weekend, right? That's a frequent talking point. And last year, I think the consensus was Mike Bailey. I thought Mike Bailey had a phenomenal WrestleMania weekend, you know, as an example. In past years, people like Keith Lee, uh, you know, you go right down the line. I, you know, Will Ospreay have been the, the people who dominated the weekend. Right. And came out of it with the most buzz or they broke through or they had the best matches. And when I look at it this year, when I look at what you have to look at are, 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 are who, who are the top wrestlers, who's poised to break out. But then just as important is who are they booked against? You know, they need dance partners. And I mentioned two of those Vikingo matches and you mentioned the third one. It's all set up for him. Yeah. He has an opportunity to just have great matches all throughout the weekend. Yeah, and El Hijo de Del Vikingo, and we're going to transition to AEW um, in a minute, a promotion that you cover on the flagship Patreon.com, 
Um, I just had a match with Kenny Omega that basically blew him up in more cat. I don't want to say casual eyes, but more more eyes than he has been seeing. Um, but it, what's your assessment on what AEW has done in over the past, let's say, three months for since the Punk incident? And that's difficult to say because the Punk incident was so vast and we got breaking developments yesterday with the Punk development. With with the Dave message board post, it, it it sort of sort of melded all together a little bit more what we know. But at at the same time, what 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 has been your assessment on the company since the Punk incident at All Out twenty twenty two? Well, if you just focus on twenty twenty three, I thought they had an excellent build. To the last pay-per-view in terms of maybe excellent build isn't the right word an excellent run of dynamites yeah. in terms of quality shows up to the pay-per-view and then the pay-per-view was one of the greatest pay-per-view events i've ever seen the pay-per-view delivered and there were hot issues settled at the pay-per-view there were there were great matches and i really felt like they were coming out of that pay-per-view with a ton of momentum I have not loved the current run of TV post pay per view. I haven't loved it. Now, there hasn't been the same level of of great matches in terms of week in week out, two to three great matches on it. That that hasn't been the case on this run of TV post pay per view. And I'm someone who loves great matches. Um, I think there's been a lot of shaky segments on the TV. The TV feels different. It feels like they've gone in a different direction with the TV. Um, it's just uh, the, the format feel. It just feels a little off. Uh, and there's stuff like the QTV stuff, which is just awful. And, and, and just the kind of thing that, that you, you wouldn't normally see in right. AEW, um, you know, and, and they've kickstart, they've re kickstarted this hangman page elite story, which has been going on really since the inception of the company. Let's be honest. This storyline is the running through line from the formation of the company till today. This is really a four year long storyline, which obviously takes some breaks. You know, we've had suspensions and injuries and, and uh, diversions. And there's not always a hundred percent focus on this story, but this is really hangman page and his relationship with Kenny Omega and the bucks is the running through line of the entire promotion. It's, it's the backbone story uh, that, that holds the promotion together. And we're going back to that now. And we saw the last two weeks of TV really uh, emphasized that story hard. And and we'll see. We'll see if this is the kind of storyline that can galvanize their fan base and, uh, you know, bump the ratings a bit and bump the viewership and maybe get a, a, a chunk of the – I hate to use this term because it's an overused term, and I'm not using it in the same context that a lot of other people use it, so bear with me. To get some of the more casual AEW viewers – to decide, you know what, I, I can't miss a Wednesday anymore because I'm so locked in to this Hangman Page elite story. And I don't want to miss the next chapter. So, um, you know, if I'm someone who watches three out of every four Dynamites, I'm locked in and I'm watching all four. If I'm someone that skips out on Rampage, you know what, I'm going to be home on Friday and I'm going to check. You know, that's the kind of storyline they're hoping this can be as we continue to move forward and hopefully get some resolution after four years on this Hangman Elite thing. Honestly, it's not for me. Uh, It doesn't do a ton for me. I don't find it all that compelling. I'm kind of tired of it. I don't like the deep lore aspects of it. I I roll my eyes at a lot of the ways that they they tell this story. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I hate it, but it's not a storyline that that has me deeply compelled. Um, I, I I am pretty agnostic on the Hangman. I, I like him as a performer, but um, uh, you know, I, I don't. He's not my ace. I mean, I don't. I don't see him as the as the tent pole performer that I tune into AEW to see. Now they built him that way, and I'm not criticizing that. And I do think eventually he should ascend as the ace of the company. And I think he's very popular among a large segment of their fan base. But this is where the rubber meets the road, right? We're gonna find out 
just how compelling this storyline can be as we move along. And it's clearly the centerpiece of Dynamite right now. Well, let's pop some numbers. Let's pop some numbers, boys. Let's uh, full steam ahead. The Hangman and the Elite. Let's do it. And a lot of that's going to have to do with how they go about telling this story as well. And, you know, as far as for those of you listening live on on the, the radio version of this broadcast, you know, as far as, uh, you know, Wednesday night, a couple nights ago, two nights ago, Dynamite, you know, I didn't like some of the aspects of the way they told this story. I don't like Hangman Page commandeering an ambulance like he's 1998 Stone Cold Steve Austin. I could do without that. You know, I I, I don't like those sports entertainment aspects of the uh, of the storytelling. Uh, I don't like the deep lore where you have to be an absolute AEW freakazoid to understand the placement of where everybody is standing in a segment and relate it back to something three years ago. I, I don't, I, I, I watch every show. I've consumed more AEW wrestling than 99.9% of this planet, but I can't get into that stuff. Okay. It, uh, it's creeping too close to, you know, bloodline, you know, Bray Wyatt lore for my tastes. I, 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 you know, my wrestling storytelling could be a little more direct than that. You know, it's a fine line and they're, and they're walking up to that line and, and threatening to cross it. Uh, but again, this could be the kind of storyline that can energize their fan base. Right. And we're going to find out very soon. What what do you think? The Do you think the AEW fan is different than the WWE fan? Then I'm just trying to think because because. Their fans are sort of different because they like wrestling and they like sort of the aspects of the in ring. But at the same time, you're trying to sort of cosplay aspects of WWE into AEW. They should be as different as, from WWE as possible to gain as much of the alternative fan as possible in my eyes. I think there's a lot you can learn from WWE at the same time, I think if you're going to, you have to be careful not to be a carbon copy of WWE. Otherwise, why do you exist? Because WWE is already there and they do what they do for their audience and they satisfy their audience. And to be a carbon copy or to sort of try to duplicate what they do you're always going to come across as a second rate version of what they're doing. And I think that over the last 20 years or whatever, it's been TNA slash impact has run into that problem at times. You know, there's been many different eras of impact and they don't always come across as second rate WWE, but at times they have. And I think that that has stunted or mitigated their growth because if I'm a wrestling fan who watches Monday night raw every week, uh, why would I watch a second rate version of it on Wednesday or Thursday nights or whatever it is? So, but there are definitely things that you can take from WWE that we can expand on if we had more time, but, and, and the fan bases are different to some extent, because I think if WWE presented someone like Vikingo cold on one of their shows, you know, there's a, there's still a chance he would win over their audience with his flashy moves. But I don't think he would have been over to the same extent that he got over with the Dynamite crowd. Part of that is a portion of the Dynamite crowd knew who he was because, as you sort of alluded to, they're harder, they're hardcore fans and they were more apt to have seen him in other places, whether it's AAA or Game Changer Wrestling. And the other part of that is the A, there's a segment of the AEW fan base who may not have been familiar with Vikingo, but they're more open to new faces. And being open-minded and saying, oh, okay, who's this guy? Well, they're telling me he's a big deal. They're telling me this is a dream match. Uh, Kenny Omega has endorsed him. I'm going to give this guy a chance to impress me. Whereas a WWE, you know, stereotypical family of four, they're not so much as interested or as open-minded to something like that because they're buying a ticket to see stars and see entrances and see finishing moves. And see catchphrases. And, and, and I'm not even necessarily knocking that. But it's going to be harder for someone like that to get over in front of their audience. Not that it can't be done. Right. So there are differences in the audiences. But with that said, I, I think sometimes we might overstate how different the two audiences are. And I do think the Venn diagram 
might be closer to a circle than people think in terms of who the people are. There are undoubtedly some AEW fans who despise WWE and will never bother with it again. And there are undoubtedly some WWE fans who are just, I hate to use the word again, casual wrestling fans who just want to watch Monday Night Raw, watch SmackDown now and then, and, and can't be bothered with the rest of the world of wrestling. And that's fine too. But I do think that there is a group of fans that do intersect and pay attention to both companies. Yeah, I, I actually have a friend who pays attention to both companies, doesn't pay attention to any really anything else, but he, we talk on Wednesdays, and he likes both companies. He likes aspects of both companies, and we talk, and he, he's not a freakazoid about it, you know? He's not, he's not like... He's not like trying to defend everything AEW does or everything WWE does, but you know it. It's sort of there. There can be people like that. It. I've seen it firsthand. Yeah, there's this weird culture war that's going on between WWE and AEW fans. And quite honestly, if you've been around the block like me, age undisclosed, you've seen these before. Right. And you know whether it was WWE and WCW whether it was ECW fans versus the world, whether it was you want to go back to the earliest days of the internet. Uh, Let me tell you something. This is nothing compared to the wars I saw between New Japan and NOAA fans back in the day. I mean, um, you know, talk to me or Mike Sempervivi about that someday. I mean, it's just, you know, and I was on the NOAA side. He was on the New Japan side. He's always been a New Japan guy. But these types of culture wars have always existed in pro wrestling. They're nothing new, but with the growth of social media, you know, you know, it's peaking today with this WWE AEW thing. And I think it's interesting that you bring up your friend who's kind of just someone who wants to watch some wrestling. And, and, and when you go to someone who's kind of outside that bubble, it's interesting because it's like this culture war thing to them doesn't exist. They're just someone tuning into some graps. You know, and yeah, and, it's exactly that. <laughs> yeah, and and you know, it's kind of healthy sometimes to stretch out of our bubble and talk to people like that who aren't wrapped up in all of this bullshit that we all get wrapped up into. Even if we don't want to, we're exposed to it, and it's just it can be exhausting, it can be tiring, and I get it. But it kind of speaks to my point. I do think that there's you know the Venn diagram does contain a lot of people like your friend who are just and again. This circles back to my point about Hangman and the Elite. Your friend is the kind of guy that they need to hook with this storyline so that he's locked in every week. The way that a lot of people were locked in every week when Sami Zayn was involved in the Bloodline stuff. And that storyline was peaking and got super hot. What people might not remember is the Bloodline. That's a years-long story that started when Roman Reigns returned at the tail end of the pandemic and uh, and 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 did his heel turn after he came back after right. SummerSlam a few years ago. This is a long term story that was not hot by any means. And I know we've rewritten history already, and WWE is great at that. This was not a hot story until Sami Zayn got involved, and it was repetitive. It was boring. It was not a huge critical success. Now the hardcore WWE fan always loved it. Okay, I'm going to be fair here. But it wasn't a big rating success. It wasn't a big critical success. Um, I wrote a long article about it behind our paywall uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which, you know, factually, Sasha Banks would show up on SmackDown and outdraw Roman Reigns and the Bloodline stuff, you know, in the early days of that storyline. They wouldn't admit that now. (laughs) No, yeah, especially now, right? Like, because she's a traitor and all this. But, you know... It really heated up when Sami Zayn got involved, and that was by accident. It was supposed to be a two- or three-week story arc, but he got so hot that wisely they pivoted and ran with it. And credit to Sami Zayn, who's an all-time great performer. He is an all-time great performer, along with being one of the greatest wrestlers of his generation, who his body's broken down and he may not be what he used to be at peak El Generico or early Sami Zayn, but he's an all-time great performer. And he got himself over and 
he got himself into the main event scene. And in fact, at, 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 he was the hottest performer in the company for maybe a four or five month stretch. I don't know that he is anymore, but he's still near the top. He was the hottest star in the company. He was a hotter star than Roman Reigns. People can deny that until they're blue in the face. Go look at the quarter hours. Okay. Right. So that story, once Sami Zayn got involved, circling back to my point, energized wrestling fans and the ratings got hot when Sami Zayn got hot. This bloodline, this uh, elite Hangman Page story, let's see. Let's see if AEW can kind of capture that friend you're talking about to where he needs to tune in every week to see the next step. Yeah, I I totally I totally agree with you. Like like this culture this culture where it sort of sh- shadows everything that AEW does because AEW is so virtually online as well in a way. Yeah, a- AEW and I, I've I've this, you know, people have this has been controversial to some people for some reason when I say this. I said it when the company formed before they ran a single match, and I stand by it today. It is the most overanalyzed wrestling promotion of all time, without question. We, and, and I say we because I do this too, because I review the show every week. And yesterday I did a show where I complained about the color of the ropes. So I'm not excluding myself from this, okay? Joe Lanza is nothing if not fair. It is the most overanalyzed wrestling promotion in the history of wrestling. We go, we analyze AEW with a fine tooth comb every single week. No other promotion goes through that kind of scrutiny. WWE absolutely does not go through that type of scrutiny. In fact, WWE and Raw in particular has been bad for so long that at this point, people will excuse a Raw. That has two and a half hours, two and a half hours of bad content. If they nail a half hour with the bloodline or Cody Rhodes or insert whatever was good here. Right. Right. Get the idea. They'll excuse the other two and a half hours like they didn't happen. And and wax poetic about the 15 minutes or the half hour that landed. Whereas when people review Dynamite, it can be. An hour and 45 minutes of incredible wrestling, great promos, awesome stuff. But if they missed on a segment, that gets all the attention the next day. And and that's just, that's what you get for being the challenger brand, as Tony Khan terms it, right? For being, uh, for for challenging the dominance or... uh, uh, the alleged monopolistic WWE, you get analyzed with a fine tooth comb. Right. Not, and it's not even just by the detractors. It's by people who like AEW because they're constantly on pins and needles worried that one slip up, one bad angle, one bad promo, one bad match, one bad rating is going to sink the company. Um, and that's what it is. It's fear. That's why it's so overanalyzed. By the people who enjoy it. The people who don't like it, we know why they're doing it. They don't want to tear it down. It's a graft. It's a graft. Yeah, and I've se- and I saw the same thing with with ECW, and I saw the same thing with um, you know, over the years with with you know, with other promo. It, 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 it the story the story never changes. But I'm talking about the people who enjoy AEW, people who want AEW to succeed, people who are AEW fans. The reason they hyper overanalyze the show. People like me is because there's this fear that one slip up and the castle's going to crumble. That's what it is. And I think this company's stable enough where they're getting three shows from Warner. <laughs> they're getting three shows from Warner. They're probably getting an extension from Warner. At, at the very least, an extension from Warner. They Listen, can shop it around. They can shop it around. and they're, they're about to have a fourth show. Yeah, And if, if the rumors are to be believed, a third in-ring show, four shows overall, and with the ratings that Dynamite does, you know, and, and you know, some of your listeners, it, it, listen, even if they don't get extended, I find it very hard to believe that they wouldn't find a place 
that would welcome them with open arms and give them a television deal with the numbers that they produce. I mean, uh, ignore all of the noise. Dynamite is a top five producer on Wednesday nights at minimum each week. And they're very often one of the top five non-sports programs on television over on cable television overall every week. This is a very strong performer. So, um, and, and there's a lot of indications that uh, WBD is, is very happy with them. You know, they keep giving them new shows. And uh, how'd Power Slap do? You know, uh, it's not good. Can, <laughs> yeah. And I mean, you know, set aside the fact that, you know, whatever feelings you might have about Dana White or whatever feelings you might have about the concept of the show. Uh, Dana White is an established brand who brings, uh, you know, credibility and everything else to the table. And that bombs tremendously. And, you know, uh, Tony Khan shows, you know, particularly Dynamite, they've delivered for Warner Brothers Discovery. So from that standpoint, um, I think there's a lot of uh, panic porn out there regarding their, their their place on television. And, and you know, it's unknown whether they picked up the extension. Tony Khan won't talk about it. And we haven't – we have to assume that they haven't due to the fact that, you you know, they would – there'd be a press release of some type or some news in that direction from right. mainstream from mainstream sources, you know. Uh, but but I – I am. You, you can't be totally not concerned because with the changing nature of television and right. early signs, early signs that of the right seas bubble, right, starting to possibly burst after ten years of everyone insisting that it would, we're finally seeing. So you can't be completely, uh, you know, unconcerned with the possibility, but. It's not something I think is I, – I think AEW is on television for, for years to come. Yeah, and yeah, I, I just think AEW is on a roll. Like theoretically on a roll, but but that that run of television before Re- Revolution was a legendary run of television. It, w- it was quite possibly the best run of television you have ever seen from a wrestler. We we got spoiled by AEW. This company is the best in ring company we have ever seen. And on tel- on television, I would agree. Yeah. On pay per view, in terms of pay per view quality, I- I'm I-, I might agree. So does that add American to- American wise? Because Japanese, that's a whole nother. Discussion. No, when I talk pay per view, I'm talking American pay per view. But does that add up to the greatest in ring product of all time? I, I mean. I, I, I probably too early to say. Yeah, probably, probably. I, 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 I just wanted to go out on a land, you know, but it we're, we're spoiled by what this company gives us, and just just the amount of grips people have from a small thing, small grip. It's just unbelievable to me. Joe, do you have any uh, plugs you want to give before you go? Because you have to go soon. I got to tell you, you're you're a pro. You know, you, you I give you a time period. I, I you know, and I pay attention because I've been doing this for you know twelve years or whatever. The, you know, your your move. You, you gave me a list of topics before the show, okay? And I, I'm paying attention here. You're moving us along at the perfect pace to get all your topics in in the allotted time period. And now you're setting me up for my plugs just as my allotted time period is coming to a close. This guy's a pro on Thank this you. radio show here. Um, yeah. Voice of wrestling flagship podcast on all of your, it's on every podcast. Listen, this is a big time podcast. So you're going to find it on any of your podcast catchers uh, every Friday. Uh, subscribe to that. We give you three plus hours of content that covers the entire world of wrestling it's the only wrestling podcast in the world that's going to do that for you uh, at, at the level that we do it. Uh, you're not going to get three hours of WWE talk or three hours of AEW talk or three hours of American wrestling talk. Uh, whatever the big stories are that week in the world of wrestling, Japan, Mexico, Indies, WWE, AEW, Ring of Honor, uh, Impact, uh, we are going to cover it on the three plus hour flagship podcast every single week. Uh, we've been doing it over a decade. This is not some fly-by-night operation. 
This is not one of those bevy of podcasts, many of which copy our format, which will disappear in six months. Uh, we know what we're doing. We're the pros. So if you've never heard of us, if you like what you heard here today on, uh, on this show, uh, subscribe to that show. Give us a try. Uh, there's no way that you won't like it. Uh, if you become an absolute flagship freakazoid, we <laughs> also have a we also have a Patreon with uh, bonus content. Sometimes the show runs too long, believe it or not, even at three plus hours, and uh, we have an overrun segment that our uh, subscribers uh, have access to behind our paywall with uh, with with bo- with uh, bonus coverage uh, from that given week. Uh, plus, all of our retro coverage is behind our paywall. My weekly dynamite review is behind the paywall. My ongoing Jovember to remember. ECW uh, retrospective series. A great ECW retrospective at that. I'm a subscriber to your flagship Patreon going on many years and it's a fantastic retrospective on ECW. It's the only fly by night, not fly by night because you do a lot of research on it. Um, You got Herve Renesto. Come on now. Who, what other ECW retrospective is going to get Herve Renesto? Yeah, listen, this is not, um, an ECW podcast that's going to tell you the same stories about the mass transit incident and, you know, uh, and, and Paul Heyman's rah-rah speech at Beverly Legal over and over again, ad nauseum that you've heard a million times. It's not going to be the WWE version of events that you see on their documentaries. I dig deep and I tell you uh, uh, the stories that, that helped create the, uh, the, the energy and charm around, ECW and it is uh, from you know beginning with 1992 and running all the way through uh, the end of the company so that's behind our paywall uh, Rich Krejci does a bunch of of great uh, retro topics on a month to month basis uh, behind the pay- it's just a ton of content so, so just subscribe tiers. just subscribe you $5. can get in for as yeah you can get in for as little as one dollar and then we also have five dollar tiers and uh, ten dollar tiers and uh, it's one of the um, uh, most successful wrestling Patreons in the world, and it is, and, and I believe it's the fastest growing as well over the last uh, uh, three or four months or so. So, um, so again, you know, you're not signing up for something that's going to disappear in a month. We're pros; we've been doing this a long time. So, uh, Danny, uh, that that's about all the plugs I have, and I'm and I'm uh, I got to get running here. Yeah, you so got to get running. So, thank you, Joe, for for. Yeah. Coming on to meet the press slam, and this is Monco Radio, where music and minds meet. The Venture X card from Capital One gives you premium travel benefits, perfect for seeing Taylor Swift The Eras Tour, presented by Capital One. Ooh, I do love her. Earn five times miles on flights and ten times miles on hotels through Capital One Travel. Enjoy your stay in Suite 13. Whoa, 13? That's Taylor's lucky number. The Venture X card from Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. See CapitalOne.com for details. 